life-saving stopgap measure. Surgery also has the psychological advantage of visibly removing the tumor. And from that point of view, it offers the patient and his family some comfort and hope. However, the degree to which surgery is useful is the same degree to which the tumor is not malignant. The greater the proportion of cancer cells in that tumor, the less likely it is that surgery will help. And the most highly malignant tumors of all generally are considered inoperable. The statistical rate of long-term survival after surgery is at best only 10 or 15 percent. And once the cancer has metastasized to a secondary location, surgery has almost no survival value whatsoever. The reason, of course, is that like the other therapies approved by organized medicine, surgery removes only the tumor. It does not remove the cause. The rationale behind X-ray therapy is essentially the same as with surgery. The medical objective is to remove the tumor, but to do so by burning it away rather than cutting it out. Here also, it's primarily the non-cancer cell that's destroyed. The more malignant the tumor, the more resistant it is to radiotherapy. In fact, this procedure has all the same limitations and drawbacks of surgery, plus one more. It actually increases the likelihood that cancer will develop in other parts of the body. Yes, it's a well-established fact that excessive exposure to radioactivity is an effective way to induce cancer. This had been demonstrated not only among the survivors of Hiroshima, but a research team at the University of Buffalo recently reported that less than a dozen routine medical x-rays to the same part of the body increases the risk of leukemia by at least 60%. And these routine x-rays are nothing compared to the intense radiation used on cancer patients. X-rays induce cancer because of at least two factors. First, they do physical damage to the body, which triggers off the production of trophoblast cells as part of the healing process. Second, they weaken or destroy the production of white blood cells, which, as we have seen, constitute the immunological defense mechanism the body's frontline defense against cancer. As with all forms of currently popular treatments, once the cancer has metastasized to a second location, there is practically no chance that the radiology patient will live. So, in addition to an almost zero survival value, radiotherapy has the extra distinction of also spreading the very cancer it's supposed to combat. The record of so-called anti-cancer drugs is even worse most of them currently in use are highly poisonous, not just to cancer, but to the rest of the body as well. In fact, generally, they are more deadly to healthy tissue than they are to the malignant cell. Most of these drugs are described as radiomimetic, which means that they mimic or produce the same effects as radiation. Consequently, they also suppress the immunological defense mechanism and thus help to spread the cancer to other areas. But whereas x-rays usually are directed to only one or two locations, these chemicals do their deadly work on every cell in the entire body. The use of exotic and highly toxic drugs is the latest fad in cancer therapy. As scores of these drugs are developed each year, cancer patients become the human guinea pigs upon which they're tested. The tragic results are well depicted in the following statements taken from just a few of the official chemotherapy reports of the National Cancer Institute. An effort was made to choose patients who were well enough to withstand the anticipated toxicity. Early death of two of the first five patients treated caused a reduction to eight milligrams per kilogram per day. No significant anti-tumor benefit of any duration was observed. In this study, six of the eight children died. No therapeutic effect was observed. Toxic clinical manifestations consisted of vomiting, hypertension, changes in oral mucous membranes, and diarrhea. Renal damage and cerebral edema were observed at post-mortem examination in each of the six patients who died while receiving this drug. The death of two patients was unequivocally caused by drug toxicity. Eight of the 14 patients who survived their initial courses of therapy showed rapid and general deterioration and died within 10 weeks after therapy began. And so it goes, year in and year out, deadly experiments, 
fully approved by organized medicine. Experiments that can be viewed only as a form of human vivisection. This then is the comparison between vitamin therapy and orthodox treatments. The statistics that follow are taken from the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, and from the clinical records of those physicians who have used Laetril in the treatment of their own patients. They vary widely depending on the age of the patient, the sex, the cancer location, and the degree of malignancy. Consequently, the figures shown will be averages for all kinds and all groups together. This is the story they tell. Of those with advanced metastasized cancer who have been told by their physician that there is no hope, only 15% will be saved when they turn to vitamin therapy, which is not good. But under orthodox treatment, less than one out of 1,000 or one-tenth of 1% one will survive five years. Of those with early diagnosed cancer, at least 80% will be saved by vitamin therapy, but no more than 15% will survive under orthodox treatment. And of those who presently are healthy with no clinical cancer to begin with, close to 100% can expect to be free from cancer as long as they routinely obtain adequate amounts of vitamin B17. But those who subsist on the typical American diet and rely only on the therapies of organized medicine are doomed to a survival rate of just 84%. And that figure includes all ages. It is much less for those above 30. As mentioned previously, these figures will vary widely depending on age, sex, cancer location, and degree of malignancy. Also, they're somewhat arbitrary when it comes to separating early diagnosed cancers from those that are advanced, for often there's a gray area between the two. Nevertheless, in general, they are as accurate as any such tabulation can be, and they tell an impressive story that cannot be brushed aside. Considering the lack of results obtained by orthodox medicine, it's been said that voodoo witchcraft would be just as effective and perhaps even more so, for at least then the patient would be spared the deadly side effects of radiation and chemical poisoning. Just as we are amused today at the primitive medical practices of history, future generations surely will look back at our own era and cringe at the senseless cutting, burning, and poisoning that now passes for medical science. No matter how useless or even harmful current practices may be, Consensus medicine demands that they be used by every physician. Regardless of how many patients are lost, the doctor's professional standing is upheld because those who pass judgment through peer review are using the same treatments and getting the same tragic results. On the other hand, if a doctor deviates from this pattern and dares to apply nutrition as the basis of his treatment, even if he attains a high degree of success, he is condemned as a quack he may lose his hospital privileges and even is subject to arrest. There's no doubt that most of the opposition to vitamin therapy comes from well-intentioned people who simply don't yet have all the facts. But vested interest also plays an important role. As stated at the beginning of this presentation, the science of cancer therapy isn't nearly as complicated as the politics of cancer therapy. The history of how these vested interests have succeeded in influencing the medical profession, government agencies, and public opinion is a fascinating story by itself. But of course, time doesn't permit it to be told here. For the full story of both the science and the politics, read World Without Cancer. This book contains all the information presented in this film, plus a great deal more. It includes extensive extracts from primary research documents, and is amply footnoted so that the serious student can pursue his own avenues of investigation. We recommend that you obtain several copies of this book for the purpose of lending to your friends. The information contained could well save their lives. Once vitamin B17 is as widely understood and available as other vitamins, cancer then will be as rare as is scurvy or pellagra today. When nitrilicides are used perhaps as a routine seasoning to our food, like iodized table salt, then the battle finally will be won. 
This is our goal. And it's an objective that can be reached right now by anyone who will act upon this knowledge. You and your family now may become secure from cancer. But that's only because someone else has helped to bring these facts to your attention. Can you do less for others? Join with us in this noble task. Together, we can create a world without cancer. Thank you.